Very special thanks to Cars of Somerset for providing the Abarth in this review, and of course, if you want to check out their stock list, maybe even details for contacting them, or even getting them to find your car across the UK, then of course check the link right below this video in the description, where you can find all of those contact details, current stock list, etc. <laughs> A few days ago, of course, I reviewed the Vauxhall Corsa VXR Nürburgring Edition here on the channel, and the same day that I drove that car, I also drove this one, the Abarth 595. Now, obviously this is based on the Fiat 500, but one of my favourite things about how Abarth offer this vehicle is the amount of variation that there is. And this is probably the only occasion where you'll hear somebody liken an Abarth 595 to a Porsche 911. <laughs> because obviously not in any kind of performance sense or driving feel or anything like that, but specifically what I'm talking about is the fact that this car has so many different variations within the quote unquote hot hatch version. Because if you think of a typical hatchback which has a hot variation, you tend to have a number of lower level petrol engines, lower level diesels, maybe a hybrid, and then you have one or two specific hot hatches. Take the Ford Focus for an example. You've got all those lower level ones, you've got something that might have a sport badge in there somewhere, and then you've got the ST and the RS. It goes up in a natural progression. Then on the other hand, even in the sports car segment, referring to when I mentioned the Porsche 911, as I mentioned in an older review for a 911 here on the channel, one of the best things about that car is that there are so many variations of it, unlike most cars in that segment, that it can pretty much cater to anyone. Hardcore track day monster, all round speed machine, more affordable handling based model, etc, etc. What a bath has done here is kind of similar to that, or at least for me, it reminded me of it, because the Abarth 595 comes with everything from around the 140 horsepower region, which is the one that I'm driving here, up around 160, 180, even 190 horsepower, but they all look very similar. They all are genuine hot hatches, with the same kind of funky style, the cute looks, the great handling, and the value. And crucially, of course, great practicality as well. That to me is a great idea, because it means that you cater for the people who like the look of the sporty one, but don't necessarily want a 200 horsepower hot hatch. For some people, you know, as weird as it might sound, that might genuinely be too much power. They might not want a 200 horsepower hatchback, especially the kind of person who's going to buy a Fiat 500. Now, with that in mind, what can this one do? Because the one that I'm driving has 140 horses, so that could easily feel sluggish, but let's not forget, this is coming from the same family as one of my favourite hot hatches of all time, one which I'm yet to drive, but have no doubt I'm going to love, the Fiat Panda 100 HP. Now, Evo Magazine, back in the day, I believe, if I recall correctly, gave that car their Car of the Year award. Or at least it was very high up there. With only 100 horsepower, it was so much fun. This feels very similar to what I imagine that will feel like, but this one does have even more horses. Now, with that 1.4 litre, 140 horsepower turbo aspirated unit, you actually put out more torque than power, and that and anyone who knows me and my tastes is a great thing, as far as I'm concerned, for two reasons. One, in fact, technically three reasons. One, torque is good for fuel economy, because it means the engine isn't working as hard and you get more performance out of lower revs. The second thing is kind of tied into that, and that means that, again, because you have more torque, it's simply easier to drive. You don't tend to stall as much, you don't tend to need to rev the nuts off it to get the best kind of acceleration off the line, say for city driving, and of course, crucially, for performance. In the case of a hot hatch, having that torque means that on uphill sections or rapid changing up and down through gears, you're never really wanting for torque in any particular gear. It has that thumpy little 1.4 motor, which puts out 152 pound feet, which is 206 newton meters. So 140 horses, 152 pound feet. And for a lower end version, those are pretty good numbers to be working with. In fact, that makes it a perfect rival for something like 
its own Panda 100 HP, although it surpasses that, something like a Polo GTI from Volkswagen, or even something like a Suzuki Swift Sport, for example. It's perfectly placed even on the lower end of the 595 scale. Now, to say it's the lower end, don't be fooled by that. The performance is good on this thing. 0-60 is 7.9 seconds, and the top speed is about 127 miles an hour. Now, as you'd expect with a smaller engine, with slightly less power, and perhaps counterintuitively for some people, the fact that it's turbo aspirated means that the fuel economy is very good. Here's the thing though, there's a weird dichotomy which happens, and I'm sure many of you can vouch for this, especially those of you who drive hot hatches or just hatchbacks in general in real life, and that is that technically hatchbacks, hot or otherwise, have some of the best economy you can get in a car for fairly obvious reasons. Smaller engines, less power, smaller, lighter vehicles, and they don't tend to be driven in a way that's, you know, going to be crazy, at least in the case of a normal hot hatch. On the other hand, if you actually compare the on-paper quoted fuel economy figures of hot hatches to what most owners actually report getting, you will often see, hilariously to me, a bigger difference in what the manufacturer says it will do to what it actually does than you will with a supercar. Because with the supercar, they're just bad, and that's the kind of economy you're going to get. The reason why that massive rift between numbers occurs, though, is obvious once you think about it. These cars are so chuckable. They have such a tiny amount of power that, as I've said before on the channel in other episodes of this series, the less power you have, the more of it you can use. So if people have less power, they are going to use more of it. And obviously when you do drive a car like this fast, the fuel economy is going to drop. So of course the average owner economy is going to take a massive nosedive compared to what the car can actually do. Because nobody drives cars like this sensibly, the whole point of a hot hatch is to have fun. Now if you do drive it sensibly, the official specs are 36 to the gallon in the city, 58 to the gallon on the highway or motorway here in the UK, that's very respectable, and an average of 47 to the gallon, which is also very nice for a hot hatch, especially something that can do 0 to 60 in 7.9 seconds. In reality, at least according to, for example, Honest John, which is an aggregator site from what owners say they can actually get out of their car, the average is more like 35. <laughs> so no way near that quoted figure of 47, but the reason why is exactly what I just said. Nobody buys a hot hatch to drive it like a grandma. Everyone uses the performance that you've got. And even though I haven't driven the 160, 180, 190, etc. horsepower versions, I would easily predict that even after driving those, this one would probably be mostly just as fun because you can just use all of those 140 horses. Now there are two things of course that we need to get to in this review. One is obvious from a performance perspective and that is the handling. What is this thing like through corners? And the second thing is practicality related. You know, six foot three guy in essentially a drivable jelly bean could be a recipe for a bad back. So we're gonna talk about that in a second as well. It is one of the key points in the thumbnail after all. So first of all, let's talk performance in terms of handling. Put simply, it's exactly as good as you'd expect. It's a ton of fun through corners, easily rivals something like that Corsa VXR from a couple of days ago. That of course has way more power, but that can sometimes be a disadvantage. This car has such cute proportions. It's almost reminiscent actually of a K car from Japan, K-E-I. Those small hatchbacks which have legal limitations on the size of engine and physical proportions that they can have, wherein they're short, they're narrow, but they're usually quite tall, so the headroom is actually pretty good. The Fiat 500 in this form, the 595, has that same kind of vibe. It's not overly long, it certainly isn't overly wide, but the headroom is actually pretty good. It has kind of a bubble shape to it, so if you are a bigger driver, I would actually say you're going to have little to no problem driving this car, and that again is even for someone like me who prefers to drive automatics, even having to use that admittedly tiny clutch pedal <laughs> in this car, I was still able to do it. Now with that being said, it's not necessarily the kind of vehicle I would want to live with every day, but that's about more than just the space and the size, it's just not really my kind of car. However, if you are even remotely into the idea 
of an abarth, you know, in any power form, I would go ahead and say that you're probably not going to be disappointed. And in fact, to touch on that interior once again, not just in terms of space, but overall, I would easily say one of my favorite things about this vehicle, which is unsurprising for an Italian, is the style, but the interior style as well. Of course, there's a lot of plastic. Yes, it creaks, obviously, but they put so much effort into making it look like a really funky little place to be. I happen to love color-coded dashboards, and there are so few vehicles these days which have that. The BMW Z8, I believe a number of Wiesmann models, and the Fiat 500. <laughs> I mean, interesting group of vehicles you've got there, but I love that. It, it just adds that little bit of flair. You could view it as a gimmick, but I think it's a gimmick that works. I happen to like gimmicks on vehicles very much. And just the rest of it is cool, that little turbo gauge that you can see with sport written in it. The way the heads-up display is in front of you in that circular pattern. And interestingly, one of the things I like about it as well is something which I haven't seen in many other vehicles, at least in the standard heads-up display mode, and that is the percentage of throttle that you're using at any given time. That was actually pretty cool to see. Initially, I thought that was a, a miles per gallon indicator, and I was kind of concerned that it was so low, but then it made sense. I was driving at normal speeds in traffic, so of course the throttle level was lower. That's a cool little feature. It almost makes it feel like you're driving a little real-life version of a, a racing game. And again, that's a lot of the fun of a hot hatch. You are kind of like driving a mini race car, or at least in your mind, you are. <laughs> now, overall, what kind of prices should you expect to buy for one? And what issues, crucially, can they sometimes have? Because of course it is a Fiat at the end of the day, so it could have issues. Well, first of all, for pricing here in the UK, they do vary, of course, depending on power as well. And one of the interesting things is, you don't necessarily need to pay that much more for the more powerful ones either. They all seem, at least through, for example, Auto Trader, to be a similar kind of price. And that particular price bracket ranges from about six grand up to about 12. Now, technically, you can pay like 30 grand for one of these, and that's for essentially a brand new car. That's not exactly the way I would spend 30 grand, but you know, each to their own. Six grand is a pretty nice entry level point. This one, for example, is more like eight or nine. So you can quite easily pay within the six to 12 grand region pretty much whatever you want. Depends on the mileage and the condition and the spec that you're looking for. Now, when it comes to issues that these can have, mostly, at least from the research that I did online, and of course owners or previous owners, feel free to correct me below with your personal experience, they don't seem to have a crazy amount of common issues. It seems to be, again from what I could see at least, certain owners having certain issues, but kind of like any car would. There doesn't seem to be like one crippling thing across all models, and that's a good sign. Now, some of the issues that they can have are that the earlier vehicles will sometimes have some Bluetooth connectivity issues, the door handles can sometimes work their way loose, the washer jets for the windscreen can sometimes have issues, and the last one I'm actually adding myself, but I think a lot of those people would probably agree, and this is modifications, because the car is so tunable, so modifiable, and so responsive to modification that it's not so much it's a bad idea to tune it, but if you are going to buy one, and if you are choosing, for example, to buy one that somebody else has maybe put more power into, make sure that they have, obviously, receipts and all that kind of stuff, but that it's just been done with care, that it's not a bodge job. Make sure that whoever tuned it or had it tuned had it done the right way, had it done in a way that is clearly loving to the car, not just something that was slapped together and again, crucially when it comes to power, not tuned up to a level that the car can't handle. Because getting a certain amount of power out of an engine doesn't mean that the rest of the car can cope with that. Diffs, for example, gearboxes, even just drive shafts, you can immediately run into problems when having huge amounts of power out of a smaller engine, or really any engine. But in a car that is so much smaller with such a small engine, it can be exacerbated even more. So those are the kind of things that you should be looking out for. My overall verdict on the 595 is, yeah, I can see why people love it so much. In my opinion, maybe not the 140, but I could even see the 140 being in there. I think this is guaranteed to be a future classic. I think there's no question that this car is going to remain 
at least as collectible and at least as popular as it is, because why wouldn't it be? The classic Fiat 500 was popular, it's kind of like Italy's answer to the Beetle. It is that little cult car. It's cute, it's funky, it doesn't really look quite like anything on the road, at least here in the UK. The performance is good, everything from the normal Fiat version to the faster Abarth versions, it kind of has something for everyone. So yeah, I totally understand the appeal, I get why people like it. And it's a car which manages to be almost masculine and feminine at the same time. You could certainly enjoy this car for what it's good at, regardless of who you are. And to be honest, regardless of your age, it could appeal to a boy racer, but it could appeal to an older person as well. Not many cars can actually tick both of those boxes. So yeah, big respect to a Bath. I like what they've done here. Not the kind of car that I would buy, but that's more just for space related reasons in general, you know, rear seats, trunk space, etc. But overall, Great little motor, of course stick around on the channel for more reviews, and if you want to check out the reviews which I mentioned, such as for stuff like the Ford Focus RS, the, the Vauxhall, and I've reviewed others as well, like the Golf R32 and Civic Type Rs, then of course click the playlist here on screen, and you can check out all of those as well. But until next time, I'll see you then, and for now, as always, thanks for watching.